the car is so stupid looking that the first assumption people have is, was this a home build? <laughs> And I tell people, no, I'm from Switzerland. It's, 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 this is real. This is a, it's a special car. I only made 2,600 of these. Kendall Jenner has one. Yeah, this, it's worse than that. It, this car hasn't run since the Detroit Auto Show in 1997. Can you get it going again so that I can, <laughs> that I can review it and talk about how stupid it is? That's really what I'm looking for. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of the BMW Blog Podcast. This is episode 66. Today we're joined by Horatio, Editor-in-Chief. How you doing, H? Hey, uh, good to see you guys. Good to see you. We have, we also got Nico. How you doing, my dude? How's it going, man? Uh, good, 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 good. Excited for our guest, uh, and uh, not to stretch this out too much. I'm happy to welcome our special guest for today, the one and only Doug DeMiro. Doug, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Nice to be here. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're super glad that you could join us today. We've got a few talking points lined up, your car collection, how you got into the car scene. Um, but of course, before we dive into all that, just in case any of our listeners have been stuck in a garage uh, trying to fix an old Ferrari 360 for the past 10 years, uh, tell our listeners a bit about yourself, about your background, your day job, your hobbies. Uh, the floor is yours, good sir. Okay, well, I, uh, I run a YouTube channel where I review cars. It's just my name, Doug DeMuro, and uh, it it seems to be uh, as all sorts of cars, new, old, weird, exotic, cheap, everything sort of runs the gamut. And then in addition to that, I have this uh, car auction website called Cars and Bids, where we sell cars that are kind of cool and quirky and interesting cars from the modern era. So like the 17 digit VIN era, the 80s and up, basically. And that's kind of my entire life because those things take up pretty much my entirety of my time. I have a couple of misfit cars myself, and um, yeah, that's that's my world. That's pretty amazing. So you're basically day and night surrounded by cars. What a tough life. I know. It's the, kind of the dream, isn't it? I was thinking about that yesterday. I was reviewing a car that I wasn't really all that excited about, and I was thinking at least... I'm doing this instead of sitting in a, you know, it's, there are way worse places to be. I, my first job I had was at a desk in a cubicle with Excel, and this is way better than that. I can only imagine. Uh, so speaking of that, I just want to roll into the very next question. I'm super excited to, to ask this because given the chance, I think every kid and adult that's into cars basically dreams of the opportunity to travel across the states and doing car reviews. How did you like... How did this become a thing for you? And, and what advice would you have for any uh, would-be uh, automotive reviewer that's, that's listening right now? Yeah, it's a good question. I, it became a thing for me. I started doing this. Um, I started really doing YouTube back in 13. And I sort of really kind of kicked it into high gear, so to speak, uh, in 16. Um, and basically what happened was I, I left my desk job and I, I started writing um, about cars. And um, for like a, it was called The Truth About Cars, and I think they still exist. And then that sort of parlayed into Jalopnik, uh, which was much bigger back then. This was like 2013. And I got an email one day from a reader who liked reading my articles, and he said, hey, you should make videos. And it, it hadn't occurred to me before that. <laughs> Sounds so stupid. But I truly hadn't. And, and so I thought, all right, maybe I will. This was kind of in the Wild West days with both YouTube. You could do whatever. And um, so I started making videos. And now 600 videos later, whatever it is, here we are. And uh, and the writing is I don't really do as much, although I really enjoy it. And as far as advice, um, I always tell people to make the content that your viewers want to see rather than the content that you want to watch. I think that's a big, big thing that I try to impress upon everybody um, which I think is why my channel, one of the reasons why my channel has done well, yeah, people, it's fun to drive the cars, which I do, but it's, I, to me, it was always, I thought people might be interested in seeing like the little details and things like that. And that seemed to be true. And so, yeah, I don't get on the track as much as everybody else, whatever, but I, I'm making the content that I think my, my people want to see. Interesting. Interesting point. I think Nico has some questions tied to like the type of cars that, uh, that you've been reviewing and, and, and I, I won't, I won't spoil it, Nico. It's, I won't take, take your thunder away. It's interesting because you've seen so many cars, um, and you obviously have your own preferences. Um, but I always, I always think back to that saying that you should never meet your heroes. Um, and taking that and applying it to cars, um, was there ever a time when you arrived at a location thinking like, all right, I can't wait. This is going to be epic because it's the 
fill in the blank cards. It's the it's whatever. Only to be let down by one thing or another. Has that ever happened to you? And if so, like, like just walk us through some of that because obviously you've gone through so many cars. It happens sometimes. I will say the opposite happens more, which is that I show up and I'm tired. I'm like, whatever. I'm some car I don't really want to do. And then I drive and it's like, well, this was, this was amazing. Or a car, not even, I'm not even like don't want to do it. It's just like I only have an average expectation and then the car is way better. That happens more often. Um, and it's typically the older cars that'll, that'll do that. So you, you hear, like I just reviewed the 2004 Mustang Cobra, the Terminator Cobra. And, you, you know, Ford during that era, they made a lot of cars that were real bad, <laughs> like just not good. And so I, I've always kind of liked that the idea of that car, but I assumed it would be crappy, you know, and then I drove it and it actually isn't. And that's, that happens more, but there are cars that are disappointing, um, and it's difficult. I'm going to pull up my little spreadsheet of cars that I've reviewed to try to find some examples. It it doesn't happen that often. Um, Evo 10 wasn't especially exciting. Uh, um, E34 M5 actually was great, but I don't know. I you drive the newer stuff, and it's just a little bit hard to. I'm trying to think about others. It doesn't it doesn't happen frequently, but it definitely does happen. And it's a little it's a little disappointing when it does. It's like oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, there's not that many. I'm surprised about the Evo 10. That's pretty, like, people like love that car. It's pretty famous for being great. I'm... That car is great, I think, when it's modified. And I think I, I always look for totally stock cars to drive in my videos. And it's a Lancer. Like, the interior, it's, you really need a, you, it turns, you know, I always make fun of Evo. Everyone does, you know, lowered Evos on stance and all that. Because, come on, but then, but now that I drove a completely stock one, I maybe have come to the conclusion that those people are onto something. <laughs> so it does happen, but it, it's it's not that common. Integra Type R was not like the most amazing thing, you know, that I have ever driven, which is how people talk about it, you know. Um, there have been a few. Okay, so Evo 10, Integra Type R, and I didn't hear anything about the E34 M5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that car. I think it's incredibly cool, but the problem is I've spent a lot of time with E39 M5s and... Man, that that's just to me still the car, you know. The E thirty nine, yeah. Yeah. The uh, Clive Owen Madonna Star BMW short films. That's that's what basically s cemented the E thirty nine in my mind. I was like that is the coolest thing ever. Ever. Those were so cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why did they do those? What the hell was going on at the time? <laughs> it was a really bizarre time, but it was awesome. Like I wish car companies would do stuff like that more. It was great. Yeah. Not all of them were good. They were all, some of them were kind of weird, but that one was. That one was great. Well, I mean, I, I have to, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this question a thousand times, like to the point of just being exhausting, but I have, I'd be remiss if I did not ask you, um, what is like the car that just had the weirdest, strangest feature that you couldn't believe that completely shocked you? The, the two that, that, well, the McLaren Speedtail has a bunch of crazy stuff, including, you know, it has an inductive charger. You, I didn't realize this. Okay. So the McLaren Speedtail, you drive over the pad. And that's how the car charges. Now you're thinking that sounds like a great idea. And it does, except the pad is too large to fit in the McLaren Speedtail. And so if you want to charge it somewhere else, <laughs> you're kind of screwed. You really got to be in your garage. So that was crazy. The Aston, the two videos that are my all time favorite, like quirky car videos were the Aston Martin Lagonda, the like seven, early, late seventies, early eighties Aston Lagonda, which is just the stupidest car you could possibly imagine. And then the Vector, I, I shot a Vector W8 um, a few years ago, and that is, that was the second stupidest car you can imagine. But they're both like my very favorite videos that I've like ever, ever done. They're all, and both of those cars have too many quirks to name. The Aston Lagonda has its odometer under the hood and CRT screens for like, like a Pong, you know, like CRT old green and black, like pixel screens for the gauges. And the Vector W8 has fighter jet stuff for for the gauges, which is bizarre, and a three-speed auto. And it's been cool to check out some of these cars that I've only ever, you know, heard about. Right. It, it is amazing, the stuff that you, you find in, in these cars. And it's, it's like some of it really is mind-blowing like that. And I've always wondered, are you just like the best car researcher in the world so you know these ahead of time? Or do you spend like hours digging through the cars before you shoot the video? Because you go more in-depth than anyone. That's a good question, and not that many people ask me that, but because I, I think they just think that it's it isn't easy. Um, the answer is I spend a lot of time with the car. So what I do is I show up and I talk to the guy and I shoot the intros, and then I spend about two hours 
doing nothing, not filming a thing, just making a shot list of all the stuff I can find. And I've gotten good at it now to the point where I can find the stuff relatively quickly. It, for, initially, it was hard because I didn't know what people wanted to see. And I sometimes went too deep into this infotainment and then they we were bored. They didn't want to see all the tech. And so I've kind of learned how to strike the right balance. But um, the funny thing is the owners of the cars are hopeless, uniformly hopeless, because if you live with a car for long enough, the, it doesn't seem quirky anymore. The fact that some of this stuff is weird to, to me or to the viewers isn't quirky anymore. And so, like, I ask them and they're like, this car has no quirks. And meanwhile, I make a 27 minute video of, you know. <laughs> But because they've owned it for ten years, to them it seems like it's not crazy. So you, I don't. You used to ask the owners for help, but they're not. They're not useful. Not because they don't try to be, but they just usually have gotten to the point where you know they don't realize it. Yeah, they, they're used to looking under the hood for their odometer. Is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> right. What do you mean the odometer's not under the hood in your car? <laughs> right. Yeah. So has a customer ever been like kind of almost insulted that you like think things are quirky? Or <laughs> like have you ever been like this is weird and they, they kind of get mad about that? Yeah, sometimes I think people do, which is funny because I I try not to point out things that as flaws. I, there are some people who are very sensitive, and and they think that by pointing it out as a quirk that I'm actually saying that it's a negative, but that I'm usually not, unless I'm saying this is bad. Usually I'm just saying this is weird, and they think that that means bad, but it doesn't always. Oh, Domino under the hood, I think it's hilarious. I, I don't think that's bad necessarily. It's just like okay. <laughs> That happened, I guess. But yeah, sometimes sometimes people get mad and sometimes the automakers get mad, although rarely. Um, but it happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah. James, I know you have a few questions lined up if you want to ask another one. Ever since like I discovered you, Doug, like it's a thing. It's a thing, right? It's it's your signature and I I, I would do the automotive world a disservice <laughs> if I didn't ask about your now famous signature intro. How did this uh, come to be a thing. I mean, it, and you've seen you've seen all the like compilation videos on YouTube. I'm sure it's like it's a thing now. I made a reel on Instagram a couple of days ago. I I was like showing different shots of my car. I was like, and I use your VO like this. Th I, I it's amazing. Tell us about it. The funny thing about that VO, so that like made rounds on TikTok. Apparently, it was like huge on TikTok. Somebody stitched all the this is together, and sometimes I'll get comments from people being like, "Oh my god, this is where that comes from." <laughs> They just discovered you like, oh, it's like you got famous from that. On We have people on cars and bids because, you know, I write a little Doug's take in every car and we'll have people sending the listening back to us and be like, who's this guy? And what is he commenting about the car? Like, why is he giving this opinion? And I'll be like, what the hell? But the, this thing, I don't know where that started. It, it, I guess it was initially like this is a whatever, like everybody says, and then it just sort of got bigger and bigger. And I think what would happen is sometimes I would get really excited, like the Bugatti Veyron, and I'd be like this. And that just sort of grew. And now here we are, I guess. <laughs> and somehow I've gotten like a, I, I, I've gotten, I don't have a literal trademark, but it feels like I, my signature is the word this. And so when everybody, anybody else does it, commenters will call them out. Like you stole this from Doug DiMuro. And I want to be like, well, no, it's the word this. Like that's, that's, <laughs> steal that. <laughs> it's okay. It's amazing. That's incredible. I, I love the fact that some people are like, who is this guy? And you're like, you know, you're on the, but I, it's it's the same. Per uh, never mind. Never mind. It's crazy, but it, I guess it's good for cars and bids because it transcend kind of transcended me. And also, it's funny on TikTok. Like so all these people are younger. Some of them aren't even into cars, but they've heard that this thing over and over, and they use that for their video or whatever. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that you're getting famous from the your just signature on TikTok. That's great. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, that's, uh, let's get back to some of your like work that you're doing. Um, that, that is basically you're, you're a one person machine essentially, or were for the longest time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I had, I, I did this all by myself for a long, long time. And then when we launched cars and bids, I got so busy that I had to, cause I have, we have employees there and I got so busy that I had to hire an editor. His name's Nick and he lives in Arizona. Hey, Nick, if you're watching, hey, um, I love him. And then my best friend, Melissa, she reads my emails. Um, and so like puts them on a spreadsheet, like, hey, this person offered this car in this city or whatever. Um, but that's it. They're both part time. And um, and I'm still kind of doing it myself. I learned a long time ago that the more people you add, the more complication. And, you know, well, you know, if personnel is just like you got to deal with schedules and drama and I just, I'm good from, yeah, no, it, it makes sense. But from like ideation to like securing a car to, I'm assuming you have to do some location scouting to actually traveling to, you know, the, the person's house or the dealer 
to the shoot itself and then editing how do you how do you manage all these things without like imploding and what's like the time frame of like let's just take one car uh for instance where you know you have the list it pops up on 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 your screen you're like that looks like uh it's something that that i want to do from that moment until like the video is published just to give people an idea of how long it actually takes to to go like i'd like to go shoot that car and you hit publish it, it yeah it's an interesting con it depends a lot on the car so like the volkswagen id buzz i recently shot which is like the the electric van um you know i get an email from volkswagen saying hey you want to come do this well i know that's going to be a huge hit so i'm like yes of course and then that video goes up maybe a week later because that's the embargo date which means you know the date that the automaker has said all the reviews can go up so that that those can turn around in the span of a week or two but um, for kind of older cars that it's not as important to get them up as quickly, yeah, it, it, it's I, I've got some that I've been sitting on for over a year just waiting for like the time to work it into the schedule, um, which I hate, but the new cars always take priority. So um, because they're, you know, I can get the same number of views on a Lamborghini Countach today or in five years because that car is the same amount of relevant. But the M5 CS, which I shot today, that car is only relevant, and I'm already beyond where it's, where it's relevant, frankly, but that car is only relevant for, you know, X number, Subaru Solterra, which I just shot. That car is only relevant for X number, of, and you got to get those up first, and so they always they always take precedent. Um, but, you know, I get the email. I, I Writing a script now is taking two, three hours to really do enough research. Um driving to the car. I live in San Diego. A lot of the cars I shoot are in Orange County or in Los Angeles, which is LA can be as much as four hours away with traffic. And so that's, that, that can be a, a trip. Um, and then, you know, yeah, filming the video takes four or five hours, usually maybe more. Um, and then, you know, coming home and editing the video and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's a process for sure. I think a lot of people see I've always kind of felt that a lot of people see Doug in his stupid shorts with his stupid T-shirt and they're like, that's a guy that could do that. And it's like, well, try because <laughs> it ain't easy. I promise you. No, yeah, I was actually just going to commend you for this because you do do, like you said, almost all of this by yourself with just, a, uh, you know, a few uh, employees or a few helpers. And like, I, I mean, I shoot most of my videos by myself and they're not even close to anywhere near as good. And, you know, I can only imagine how difficult that all is. So th I, my hat's off to you. I appreciate that. I think I think a lot of people think, and you can probably back like people think, oh, it's thirty minutes. It probably took them an hour. Like the video is twenty five minutes long. It probably took forty five minutes to shoot, and it's like no. <laughs> but if you haven't been in the space, you don't know. And frankly, my videos take less time. I did a commercial for Audi in June because I have this RS two, which is the coolest thing in the world. And I saw that. It was really fun. It was that was a good one. It was really cool. And that we I was in the I was in that commercial for a minute, and it took a day. So my, I'm like nothing compared to like real productions. So uh, my problem is that like last week I was in Germany and I literally had from like 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. with a break in between to literally shoot four videos. And we're talking about cars and technology that I've never seen before. So I was briefed on literally five minutes before, you know, I went out to drive the cars. So now the yeah. problem is that if you make a, a, a mistake, which you're bound to make one, there is no yep. way. People call you out and they call you out because, okay, the production quality is not there. How come you were wrong about that? And they assume all the time, like you said, that you have like a full day to film and do all of that. Right. When I literally had like probably 45 minutes for one card and move to the next one and move to other products and all of that. Yeah. So I struggle a lot trying to teach people that there is a lot going on behind the scenes. And especially when you go on location for a lounge, it's a lot yep. harder than when you get the car home. And you can do all of that. That's right. I, I desperately try to have as much time as, as possible with the car. If I can get the car here, I always can. I always try. Um, but the, the thing is that I've learned, even if, because I did, I had a I, the Z06. I got two hours with the new Z06. And that's just nothing. You know, and I still somehow made a 25 minute video, but it was really hard. And I miss, I made two small mistakes. And the thing that I've learned is people don't care if, you know, like you're saying like, oh, I only had a short amount of time and a small briefing and I had to get it done. And yeah, I want to tell that to everybody. Like this was, I tried so hard. I got, I only made two mistakes. I want to like hold it up. But the, the thing is, it doesn't really matter to people. And so you, you don't like have the luxury of being able to explain yourself, which is the hard part. And so you just have to, it's tough sometimes. I'm I'm still hearing everybody complain that I called out that the M4 CS wasn't actually like, it is limited. It's just not as limited as the M3 CS. And I spent over a year to make a 30 minute long video over a year. People just get so, and it's, and it's some of the stuff is just tough to hear. Like, dude, this is so meaningless. I got it. I, I like, there was like a, 
I said in my C8 Z06 video that the front, this is the first time a Z06 has ever had a different front fascia, than, front and rear fascia than other Corvettes, which by the way, I got from their press release. But anyway, it turned out that is entirely true, except the C7 had one more inlet in the front. All the other cars had the same front and rear fascia, but the C7 had one more inlet. So actually GM was wrong in their release, fine. But I said it, and then that is the thing. And it's like, okay, we're looking at a car that has whatever it is, 650 horsepower, mid-engine, like this is the, and we're gonna talk, of, and there was like a back and 100 multiple comment back and forth about this, the front fascia thing. And I'm like, well. Before I let the guys continue with their questions on the, uh on the strategy with the embargoes, because I struggled with this actually yesterday. There were a couple of embargoes that were supposed to go live on the on the, uh, BMW cars. One was an i7 electric, and then the other one was a regular 7 Series. All brand new cars, brand new products, very few people tested. How do you make the decision which one goes live? Or do you, or here, here's what I did yesterday. I made the mistake of publishing both kind of around the same time because the embargo expired. And, um, and of course, one of them did well, the other one not so well. Yeah. So how do you deal with that when they're two hot products and the embargo is uh, it's at the same time? I don't know. It's hard. And you know the hard part is I, I still to this day don't know what videos are going to really blow up and which ones are. <laughs> like I, I, had, I'm do, I have an, an ad integration coming in one of my videos next week. And the, you, the person I was coordinating with said, I, I offered him two videos. And they said, which do you think will do better? And I'm like... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I say. It's going to be wrong. So I took a guess. But that it's, it, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, some, some you can tell. Like ID Buzz, you knew was going to blow up. And, and there, there, there's ones here and there you can tell. But so much of the time, I literally have no clue what's going to happen. And I'm astonished. And honestly, that, that has informed some of my strategy watching other people. Frankly, M5 CS, I just shot this car. I, I, the only reason I waited so long to film the video is because I didn't think it was all that exciting. Ultimately, it's we've got the M5. We've got the M5 competition. This is relatively minor. But the people, other people's videos have gone up and they've blown up. So I'm like, all right, well, crap. Now I got to do that car. <laughs> and so that happens. I, I truly don't know what the answer to that is because I truly still don't know what is going to do the best it's yeah, hard yeah i struggle with data too quite a bit like you would never believe our most viewed video it's like 1.2 million and it's 15 seconds video shot in 360p vertical on youtube there's no there's no pretty and still to this day i will have in videos just completely go up and like wow okay that did 10 way better than i expected or way worse or damn i wish i had put that on a different day because it wouldn't you know whatever it's just kind of the way it works I think. So, so that sort of leads me to my next question for you. And it was like, I actually saw a Twitter thread the other day between you and like Matt Farrer and a couple of other, other guys talking about how you kind of choose your videos. And it seemed that like, you don't, you clearly say new cars perform better on YouTube than older cars. And we've even seen that on our channel as well. Um, how do you like prioritize um, and how do you like kind of work in your own, like picking between newer cars, you know, we're going to do well, like the ID buzz. And then, um, you know, like passion project cars, like a, you know, an old car that you really, really want to test and, and, you know, find all the quirky features about and like, how do you kind of prioritize that and balance that? You know, it's, it's interesting. That thread was really interesting. I posted that comment, that post on Twitter and I didn't expect people to kind of blow up that like the new cars are doing so much better. And, but it really did. And a lot of creators were replying and with their thoughts and stuff. And, and it kind of made me even think about it more. Um, one of the things that comes out of those threads whenever something like that happens is that there is a thought that the, I prefer the quirky old cars, but I'm doing the new cars like to make money. And the truth is I actually love filming new car videos. And I even love filming like cross, mid-size crossover videos because I find that that segment to be incredibly competitive and it's incredibly interesting to me to see how the automakers like distinguish themselves in little ways. And so... Like often I, I actually prefer doing the new cars and that's especially true now that a lot of the cool older cars that I've reviewed um, are in the past. I've shot the Countaches, I've shot the Enzos, I've shot, those are all kind of gone. And so more and more the new cars are becoming the passion projects, the stuff that I'm most excited about. Porsche just sent me a GT4 RS. I mean, I'm more interested in that than shooting some 911 Club Sport from the 80s. I don't care about, you know, that the, 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 the a lot of the new cars are more exciting just generally. But also, I don't know, at the end of the day, people hate to 
hear it, but it's a business and I have to run it like one. Some of the people were like, Doug, you should just focus on what you love and don't listen to anybody. Don't listen to the views. And I'm like, I don't know how much money you think I've made from this, but it's not like enough to retire at 33 or however old I am. Like this is, I need, I can't just, I can't just do what I love. <laughs> this doesn't work that way. Uh, what if I told you that about your job, dude? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. People s seem to think that because you have a few million views, you can just do whatever you want. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. So I didn't have a chance to reply to that thread, but I read it because Nico sent it to me. And I think the, uh, the only reason why new car videos do well, it's it's a combination of the Google searches and YouTube searches. Right. Yep. So a lot of the views are not necessarily driven from YouTube, but also from just searching on Google for a new product. That's right. So clearly there is there, are a lot, there is a lot more volume and that's why all the new cars are will always do better. I mean, it's just pure data. And I try to explain that to people because because they say, oh, well, these quirky cars are so cool. And, and yes, for my core traditional audience, the quirky cars are the coolest things. And those videos will always get a certain number of views because those people always watch. But at the end of the day, I posted my review of the Honda Odyssey four years ago. And that car, that's still the same Odyssey that's on sale now. And that video still gets tons of views. RAV4 is the same way. Ford Escape, I checked the other day, my Ford Escape video has almost 2 million views. That's not an enthusiast, right? That's like people who are trying to buy the car. And that's kind of the that's kind of the thing that I'm trying to impress upon everybody that like those videos have a longer tail and so not only do they do better initially, but they also do better in, in the future because yeah, there's actual in and this is one of the things that I've always struggled with really a lot on my channel generally is that um I have to cater to the audience that's both new car buyers who are interested in buying a car and car enthusiasts in a way that most other channels don't. Most other channels have either an enthusiast focused or like a shopper focus. And so I have to post like a 1990s TVR video the same week as the Hyundai Ionic 5. That's that's unusual. And trying to keep both of those audience interested is, is a little bit on the on the difficult side. But it seems like it's skewing more towards new cars for sure. We have the same strategy on the web, right? So I mean, we've been doing the website, you know, for a very long time and my content strategy is kind of similar right we do a combination of new stuff and all things too and especially the long tail keywords and all of that and i have plenty of old articles there still brings traffic like yeah. a lot of traffic every single day so you have yeah. the spikes from from the new products but then i have this consistent you know uh stream of of, of uh, traffic that comes from older articles some of them as old as 12 13 years ago really so, wow uh, yeah yeah so really so i spend a lot of time on content strategy for both new cars, guides, uh, how to's, and of course, with uh, all the cars. So it's kind of similar strategy. You're, you're applying that on the video side. We've done right. that quite a bit on the you know print. It makes sense. I never really thought that that would happen. When I first launched the channel, it was the quirky cars were everything. And I, I didn't even want to do new cars. I didn't think I was qualified to review new cars or whatever. But all that's obviously shifted a lot. And, and now I just realized like, that's ultimately what people want. And people reply to that thread and they're like, well, you know, the, the, your viewers want the old stuff. And it's like, my viewers don't, man. I got the numbers. <laughs> they literally have the data. It's not true. <laughs> so uh, one more question that I'll let James, I know he's got questions, but it's, it's kind of related. And it's just, um, is there a car that sort of like, um, like a holy grail car that you have yet to get your hands on, something you've always wanted to just really dig into and you just can't seem to get it? Because I can imagine some of these cars are difficult to get um to get a hold of for a few hours is, is there something like that um it, it, with regard to legitimate normal production cars no i've been able to shoot pretty much everything i want and now the stuff i really want to get my hands on is new stuff that's coming out like the gr corolla is the thing right now that i really however <laughs> uh i i'm i love concept cars and there are a few kind of one-off concept cars that I would literally kill someone to review. Um, and, and Sultan of Brunei cars. I love like one-off automaker made one-off cars. And so the Sultan of Brunei um, in the 90s commissioned Bentley to make him SUVs it's called the Dominator. And he had got a reportedly 11 Bentley Dominators made just for him and sent to him. And so things like that. The number one car that I most want to review is a... Um, minivan actually it's a bmw powered minivan called the Atal design columbus you ever heard of this vehicle okay i i've not but i've heard Atal design other like cars weird stuff with bmw engines i i never heard of a van though that, that kind of thing they made a van it's two levels <laughs> it's the stupidest thing you've ever heard of in your entire life google it it is the stupidest thing you've ever seen but it's like a two-level van with a bmw i think it was a bmw v12 
And obviously the most, just even saying that is the most ridiculous thing. But then you look at it and you're like, okay, it's actually even more ridiculous. That you could not prepare me for how ridiculous that is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that is my number one, uh, if I could review anything. Now, I mentioned this in a video a long time ago, and a tell design reached out to me and they said, hey, we still have this thing. You can come film it if you come to Turin. And so I said, oh my God, okay. But, um, and I'm going to Italy this summer. And so I've been emailing them, but I, I, the guy who had emailed me initially, he, I, he moved on to another company. I don't have his contact anymore. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that, but things like that. I'm now in the point where I like really want to do like weird one-offs, the Ford GT 90, if you remember that concept car from the nineties and like weird sort of special things like that. If I, if I could, um, and the automakers don't, I, I've asked my contacts at the automakers, Hey, could I review the, this concept car from 2004? And they're like, dude, this isn't, we're not pushing that anymore we're not, not oh get out of here <laughs> it doesn't work that way it's like no 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 this isn't for a you thing it's for it's for a passion thing see because that's what that, that's what people want they don't want the latest and greatest they want they want me to do what i want to do at least that's the advice that they keep telling you yeah this, it's worse than that it, this car hasn't run since the detroit auto show in 1997 can you get it going again so that i can <laughs> that i can review it and talk about how stupid it is that's really what i'm looking for <laughs> Make that work. That's, that's how I would pitch it. I actually have pitched this before to automakers. They'd be like, yeah, we'll check up on that. And I've never gotten a reply somehow. It's never, it, they've never come back to me. Two weeks ago, I was, uh, I was, I knew that I was going to Munich and I asked BMW M. I said, hey, by the way, can I stop by your M secret garage that I've seen like 15 years ago? And the reply was like, why? <laughs> Uh, like, what do you mean, yeah. why? You got all the cool custom cars there, and they're like, why? I think BMW, too, is especially sensitive about comparisons to their old stuff. I, I've noticed that in, in some of their responses to some of my stuff, and just generally, I think they're especially like, you know, they've forged sort of a new path almost more than most other brands. Like, we're going to go in this different direction and in some senses turn our backs on some of these people in order to get more people. And it, I, frankly, it seems to be like successful. But what you have is this round of enthusiasts who are saying, well, check out this car. This is how it used to be. This is how BMW is better. And maybe they're just tired of hearing that crap, <laughs> which makes sense. And you're absolutely right. They're always trying to engage with new audience too. So it's not always about what we've done before, what we can do in the future. Yeah. Plus, don't you think that BMW has got to be tired of hearing the old cars were better thing, especially because in perpetuity, the people, the cars that people say that about eventually become old cars. And then people are talking nostalgically about those cars that they had, like the, the original X5 is becoming like this. People are like, you know, that was actually a nice looking car and it drove well and it was little. And the, you know, the 4.6 IS, the 4.8 IS, they were cool. And like, I remember when that came out and people were like, this is sacrilege. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. <laughs> it's, it's like, even that like E46 when E90, E90 came out, like in 06, I remember that. And people are like, this is so big and it's awful and it's the worst thing in the world. And now it's like, the V8 M3. Oh, it was so special. And it's like... Yeah, everyone called it a, a, a M5 because it had a big V8 and it was like too comfortable. Like, this isn't an M3 and now everyone loves it. Now it's like the car. And so maybe BMW realizes like, screw these people. It doesn't matter what we put out. Eventually they'll be nostalgic for it. So we're just going to keep going and they'll get there eventually. Even the F10 is coming around like that. I remember when the F10 came out, the M5 specifically, like it was like the the E60 had this V10, and that was like the death of the cool V10 manual, and now it's going away, and there was the E39, and like this is the end. And now I see F10 M5s on the road, and I'm like, damn, that thing looks good, and I know they're not all that expensive, and I'm like, boy, I'm kind of getting lustful for those. They, they sound like heaven, too. Uh, that's So when I, I wrote the piece when the uh, G80 and the G82 came out, and it was a whole editorial, like I was trying to explain to folks, I was like, you're going to not like this. I'm going to say some stuff, you're not going to like it, but I promise you in like 12 years from now, you're going to be like, yeah, no, they're really nice. They were really thinking ahead. They don't look old. I agree. Compl I was driving the M5CS today and I was thinking exactly that. I was like, this car is, is very expensive and it's going to lose value like they all do, but like someday this will be like the like the M3 Lime Rocks and the EM3 Evo, like it'll be like the one that we all are like, whoa. And meanwhile, people here are like, that's so big and so heavy. You know, give it time. <laughs> it always happens. I want you to talk a little bit about the cars and bids, maybe how that idea came about, maybe how do you 
compare yourself or even if you compare yourself to bring a trailer and similar platforms and maybe what do you bring new to the table i mean we cover your platform quite a bit we also cover bat quite a bit because they started sure. a little sooner of course we cover some of the smaller ones like you know uh, enthusiast auto group and all these smaller shops you know so tell me more about that project maybe yeah you know i it just kind of hit me that well you know bring a trailer is great they're the best they're so good but they they seem to be trending more in the lamborghini mura you know, Mercedes 300 SL space. And I get their emails every month and I, you know, well, we sold a Ferrari Daytona this month for $1 million or whatever. And it's like, well, I don't know. I, I just, more and more people, including my friends are like, boy, that, that's not a place where I, that's not the world I live in. And so it kind of felt like we, if we created something that was kind of for younger people and sort of more of a not as insane, you know, million dollar car kind of focus, uh, and they sell a lot of not that stuff, but they sell more and more of that stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, we launched Cars and Bids. It was the intent was to focus on cars from the '80s and up, and so kind of attract a younger audience that's growing as 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 younger people get more money and as these cars become more desirable. It sort of, it sort of would continue to reach more and more people, and it's been reasonably successful so far. We're running something like 20, 20 auctions a day right now, which is really good, and. Um, we're selling a lot of cars and I don't know, I, I surprised how well it's, it's gone, especially because a lot of kind of competitors have come and gone. It's a difficult space to be in. Um, and you know, bring a trailer is still sort of the king in a lot of ways, but we've, um, you can run dollar for dollar. We've had cars that failed, you know, to sell on their site, come over to our site and bring more money. And they're, we're getting a lot of traffic too. So I kind of want to, I kind of want to own that, you know, eighties and up sort of not million dollar car space. And I think so far so good. Yeah, it is nice because because the fact that it doesn't go older than the 80s, you know, you're not getting Lamborghini Murros, you're not getting those crazy classics. So it does kind of keep the prices more normal because uh, there was a time when bring a trailer was you had to bring a trailer, you know, like the cars were, uh, you know, kind of cheap and beat up. And- yeah, you're still bringing a trailer. Yeah, it's just like because you don't want to put miles on it. You're putting an enclosed car trailer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it'll go in a bubble. I, it, it's I don't know. I, I think that they 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 do do a, a great job and they're they're really great. And I love those guys. But. Um, I don't know. I, I just thought I saw kind of an opening for this. And I think that, that the success we've had is teased out that there was a market for people who wanted to sell, you know, Land Cruisers and E90 M3s that maybe didn't have seven miles and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And, and that that world is there. So it's been it's been fun and, and a lot of work and, and stressful and everything, but it's it's gone well. One of the things that we're finding, though, is in order to be profitable, you, you just got to kind of scale. And the focusing on one make is tough. It really is. But I agree with you. There, there, there were, um, there are definitely opportunities there. And yeah, people were selling on forums. People were selling wherever they could, even Craigslist early days, whatever. And um, so, Bring a Trailer was like the right place at the right time. And I think that we've kind of capitalized on maybe some of the, some of the people who don't necessarily want the super super crazy stuff. James, you have something. I think you, you look, I thought you had something make it real silly i'm about to take it silly because it's my favorite thing to do we're gonna start with a hypothetical doug and then we're gonna transition over to some rapid fire questions this is my favorite part okay okay here we go the automotive equivalent of the thanos snap just took place okay okay and you get a text message doug all your cars just vanished except for one you look away from your phone the first response that pops in your mind is oh god i hope my blank survived what car is that blank this must be a car that i currently own or okay this is the easiest question i've ever been asked i have a 1999 mercedes-benz g500 cabriolet do you know this car it's a g-wagon but it's a convertible it's the ugliest thing you've ever seen imagine a g-wagon but shorter and wearing a toupee that's what it looks like okay it's really the stupidest (laughs) it's the stupidest thing in the history of the world but i have one and I love it, and it's perfect for every situation. I, the, it's a it's a push button top, so even though it's a SUV, it, you know, Jeeps, you have zippers and snaps and shit. This thing, you just push a thing, and it, you know, it goes down. And so I can off road with the roof off, and it's great. But I can also it's also a G wagon, so it can go on the highway at normal speed. And this is like my daily driver that that I drive around San Diego, and it's it's truly the stupidest car in the world. But it's like the do everything car, and I'm obsessed with it. Is that really your daily the G the G Cabriolet? Yeah, pretty much. I have. I, I have a, like a new Land Rover that I use for like longer, long trips. Like when I'm going to LA, I won't take that. But like if I'm anywhere around town, it's G Cabriolet top down, dogs next to me. And, and people come up to me and they say, did you, they say, did you make this yourself? And I say, no, it's so ugly. I never would have created this something like this myself. <laughs> 
that is not possible. Uh, like uh, Mercedes must feel great that people are asking if if you made a yourself. I never thought about that. I never thought about that. The car is so stupid looking that the first assumption people have is, was this a home build? <laughs> and I tell people, no, I'm from Switzerland. It's, 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 this is real. This is a, it's a special car. I made 2,600 of these. Kendall Jenner has one. No, you have to have a sense of humor when you drive that car. And you know, the funny thing is, since I bought that car, I have come to know the owners of many others, and none of them have a sense of humor about it. They like take it very seriously. It's the G-Wagon. Like, how could you possibly call it ugly? And I'm like, have you... Have you looked at it? <laughs> like, they, they all spend this. They, they're not. They're not buying it ironically. I mean, I get and buy it ironically. I use it, but I I know that it's false, and they don't. They seem to be like, no, this is the best, and I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, let's go into some rapid fire questions. Here we go. Foreign or domestic? Uh, to own, to, for me to buy, to like have. Yeah. Uh, generally, I've preferred foreign, but I have a lot of domestic too over the years. Gas, diesel, or electric? Uh, gas. Convertible, yay or nay? I think I already know the answer to that. I mean, we're in Southern California. I, I, yes, I'll have that fight till the day I die. Performance or reliability? Uh, performance. We're gonna bring it to BMW right now. <laughs> Mind you, warning, fair warning. This may be controversial. Okay. BMW M3 or M4? Uh, M3. Ooh, why? Well since they split them, I just prefer, I, I've had a bunch of fast wagons. I prefer like practical fast cars. I have this Audi RS2. I had an M3 sedan, an E36 M3 sedan years ago. I loved it. Um, but also that's the name. That's just the name. That's what the, that's what it's called. <laughs> you know, that's just, how I, I mean, the M4s are great. I, I just, that's what it's called. <laughs> you know, I'm with you on that actually. Yeah. Car did Lee agree as well. So I actually have to ask uh, t- like a bit of a two part question. One the first part is how much do you love your Audi RS2? Because it is one of my absolute dream cars. I love that thing. So I'm super jealous. And the second part is, uh, is there any car? Cause you've had a lot of really cool cars over the years. I mean, you know, I've seen your videos for a long time, like Aston V8 Vantage and stuff like that. Uh, is there anything you regret selling? Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I love the RS2. It's been amazing. Un- somehow it's been reliable. The powertrain in that car is just a 2.2 liter turbo five cylinder. It's actually a pretty reliable powertrain, but man, does a lot of other stuff break. Currently the windows aren't working. You know, it's one of those things. Um, but I love that car. That and the G cab are pretty much split my day to day driving things. And and we put baby in that car. I have a I have a little baby, and we put him in there. And he, I drove him home from the hospital in that car. So I, I think he's the first baby ever <laughs> to be driven in America. <laughs> um, but I love that car. Love, love, love. And I, I love driving a manual. And that car reminded me, I have a Ford GT also, which is a really, really cool car. But you can't use that very often. And I, I'm reminded by the RS2 just how much I love driving a stick. And, and I think I want to get another one at some point. Some, some other cool, fun manual car at some point soon. Um, car I regret selling... I had a, uh, there's a few that I regret selling for financial reasons. I sold a 996 Turbo in 2012 for $33,000, which was a mistake. That's probably doubled now. And, um, I, I, I sold a 2001 E55 AMG, which I really loved. It had really low miles, and I sold that, and, and I wish I hadn't. But most of the time when I, I sell a car, I'm kind of done with it and ready to move on. I, I My car's kind of in keeping with my increased success. My cars have always gotten better and better, and so... I, I don't usually look back and say, boy, I, you know, I wish I had kept this or whatever. And and I haven't sold a car in like five years, a, a, a fun, special, you know, not daily driver car. And so maybe I'm just now kind of hoarding them. But on the subject of BMWs and wagons, actually, I really want to get an, an E60 M5 wagon when, when I can. The RS2 is cool, but it's cool for the 90s. You know, an E60 M5 wagon, I think, would be the coolest thing in the world. Should be able to be one, right? Yeah. Is it over 25? We're, 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 yeah, we're still a few years away. So the RS2 and the G cab, I imported both those. The G cab actually federalized. I didn't, the, the people I bought it from federalized it. So, and you could probably federalize an E60 M5 wagon, but I'm not going to do it. I'm done with doing that, that stuff. I'm, I'm over the, I want someone else to take on those projects now. <laughs> what was the process like? For the G cab, it's pretty easy because the, the, the history of Mercedes G wagon in America is this bizarre long history that I, I won't get into. But basically there was a man in the 90s who purchased the rights to import G wagons personally from Mercedes Benz. Mercedes was like, we don't need to ever sell that car in America. so we'll... And so he spent millions of dollars to get the cars federalizable in a very easy way. And um, 
And then he sold them for a long time as, as his own company. And so G-Wagons are pretty easy to federalize. Now, of course, in 2002, Mercedes-Benz realized they did want to sell the G-Wagon in the United States and had to purchase the rights back to their own car, which is, an, it, the whole story is quite amazing. But, so G-Wagons aren't that bad, but it still took about a year. And mine is California legal also, which is a whole other process that you have to go through, the same process the automakers go through. Like I have a fuel economy label for my car, even though it's a 1999 model, you know. Um, and I just, I'm good with the imported. I love driving imported cars and I, I will for probably forever, but like, I don't, I, someone else can deal with the, the paint, the, the, the HS seven and the declaring at the border and all that stuff. I'm just good. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. I'm, I feel you with that. Cause that seems like a big headache, but I, I, I kind of want to bring it back to the RS two just cause I, I love that thing. I've always wanted one and this, it's almost like unobtainium in America. They're so difficult to find. Uh, and you, like you said, you imported one. They sold them in America, I think, right? No, they were never. They were never sold in the states. Um, I imported mine from Canada. It had previously been in Japan. It was sold new in Germany. The cars have done, done a world tour, basically. Yeah, I've seen a few on sale here. That was my mistake. I've seen a few on sale here, and they're pretty. They're hard to find. They're very expensive. I'm. I'm that it's such a cool car. Uh, I love. Like I'm with you on the 80s, 90s. I love those cars. And German 80s, 80s, 90s cars are like my my uh, kryptonite. What are you driving? Uh, I actually just bought an E93 series. That is my daily driver. It is just a, I actually, I barely drive. I work from home. So I literally barely drive anywhere. So. What about, what about James and Horatio? What do you, what do you guys have? Horatio, you go. Uh, no, I'll keep my last. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I have an 18 FADM 3CS in San Marino blue with carbon ceramics and that M performance titanium exhaust. Nice. Keep it forever. 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 Oh yeah. <clears throat> so my turn. <laughs> I have, a, uh, I have a BMW 1M. The best. I, I wanted that car for so long. Yeah, I truly love that car. People have wanted to buy off me for the last few months. I keep getting <laughs> offers via email, you know, and, yeah. and everywhere they can find me. But I, I can't sell it, honestly, because, I mean, I don't drive it a lot. So that's that's the downside because I live in Chicago and it's not that pleasant to drive around. It's like in California. Um and I mean, winters are super long too. So basically, it's a, yeah. it stays in the garage from like November till like April. Um, and also, the problem is that even if I get for the car, I don't know what's selling right now, 80, 90,000, whatever that is, I still can figure out what car I would buy with that money that would kind of be the same. Yep. So yep. I don't know, do you have any ideas like what car would be comparable in, let's say, the 80 to 90,000 range? I don't know. Because the, pro- the thing about that car is it's not just that the way it drives, which is great. And there's, but you could probably replace that with, you know, a nice Cayman or whatever. But like, it's also the specialness, the rarity factor of that car. Like you could get a Cayman and it would drive as well or better, but I don't turn my head. I don't know about you. I don't turn my head when I see a Cayman, but when I see a 1M, I like chase it down on the highway and take pictures and send to my friends. You know, it's, that's the difference. And I like to buy cars that are not only cool to drive, but like have some of that specialness to them and. That 1M is just the coolest damn car. It was, God, it was just, it was cool then. It's still cool. It happens the to best. me all the time. So when I take the car out and I drive it, without exception, every single time there is someone that takes photos of that car. Yeah. You know, sometimes I get a 7 Series press car or an 8 Series or an M8. And no, nobody even sees me. Yeah. Like, they're like, I'm invisible, yeah. you know? I was just having this conversation with my wife the other day because I had a 765 LT press car here, which is an amazing car, the coolest thing in the world. But I've also got this Ford GT. And the the 765 LT is a half million dollars, right? And the Ford GT is not at that not as expensive, mine anyway. And I told my wife the difference between those two is the the, the Ford GT is someone who's rich and interesting. The 765 LT is just someone who's rich. It's just someone who's like, this looks cool and I'm it's big money, I'm just gonna buy it, you know. And and I the 1M is like that. Like, yeah, you could go today and get a new, you know, an, an M2 comp, whatever it is. But, like, there's this specialness about the 1M that, like, makes it actually interesting beyond – that is more than just the abil- the way that it drives and the way that it feels and the way that it looks. It's, it's beyond that. It's like we know how rare it is and how special it is. And I have a great story behind it, too, because I picked it up in Germany, actually, in 2011. And I did a European – Oh, that's awesome. Thing. Yeah, so then I went to the Nürburgring and I did the whole European thing. You know? Wow. Uh, I mean, I did have a YouTube channel back then. I just never really documented that, you know. It was yeah. like, like you like YouTube was not a thing back then. Um, but uh, yeah. it, was, it was an amazing trip, like two weeks, you know, just driving around your own car, you know, in Germany, and I did the whole thing. But, uh, so yeah, it's super, super special. So I don't think I'll sell it unless I really have to. Yeah, that's the thing, and that's what I'm telling a lot of people right now, especially the market like it is. Like, unless you need the cash, you know, 
enjoy the car. Cars are still there. They all, they all seem to be still going up. What are you going to do with the, you know, are you going to put the cash? The inflation is going to take some of the money back. If you, if you just hoard the cash, like you might as well have fun with the car. And that one M, a lot of people probably would have told you it was smart to sell that three, four years after you bought it when you still could get what you paid, you know? And it's like, well, boy, you're probably glad you didn't do that. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, I kind of knew that it's, it's going to be special anyway, because they're not, they were never going to make one like that. There were yeah. very few units. I think the US got like 750, like Chicago, yeah. I, I think Chicago literally has six or seven one apps. I mean, in the whole Chicago land area, so they're quite quite unique. The one interesting thing about that car that I think about is they sold a lot. Of them. Car's about to be Doug Demuroed. <laughs> no, I love that car. I but they sold a lot of them in Europe, and I I'm curious what will happen in 15 years. Admittedly, it's nowhere near now, but when when those cars can start to make their way over if that's going to have some effect on the value. Probably it won't. Probably the U.S. cars will always still be like F40s. Like they only made 212 U.S. F40s, but there were 1,300 total. But the U.S. cars are worth 50% more. And that's probably still going to happen with the 1Ms. But it is interesting because it wasn't as rare overseas. But to Americans, it's like the coolest BMW in the world. I agree. Yeah, I mean, they did 6,000 globally. I don't know how many they were in Europe, 2,000 something. So. I don't think there are going to be that many imported yeah. either way, so I don't think yeah. it's going to do anything. I, that, that car will be a forever classic, basically. I agree. I was walking down, I was in Korea for a press trip six years ago, and I was. every car in Korea is gray and silver and white, without exception. Every single car. And I was walking down the street on a rainy day, which is all they have in Korea, and it was gray and ugly, and every white Kia and Hyundai is driving by, and I come around a corner, and there's an orange 1M just sitting parked on the street. And I, like, especially in Korea, that was like seeing an F50. I like lost it. I was like, this is amazing. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I still feel that way when I see him, which is never. I don't, no one's driving those anymore. I think that car is. Isn't that just sad because like the, the market is what it is and special cars are now elevated to magic and, and they're now worth so much that you're like, I don't, I don't know if I can afford to drive the car that I've been driving for the past 12 years because. And you know, the funniest thing about that is the cars that have become the most valuable and the most desirable are the ones that drive the best. 993 turbos, the cars that are known for being this analog special Carrera GT. And yet those are also the ones that are now too expensive to drive. And it's this sort of bizarre, like, counterintuitive thing. Like these collectors are buying these cars because of their driving abilities and then specifically not driving them. But that's just the world we're in, I guess. Out of the all new BMW cars that you've driven, which ones were you, or, or which one impressed you the most, basically? Um, I really, I really loved the outgoing M2, which I know is not technically brand new, but just you know the M2 CS, the M2 Comp that just went away, I think are fantastic. I think that the latest two series is a little strange looking, but I suspect there's going to be another great M2 and M2 CS and M2 Comp coming, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're at the end of the line there. Next ones are plug-in and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that the, I, I also, I'm totally like among enthusiasts. I'm the only one who has this opinion, but I think the X7 is great. Like, I think it's a great SUV and I know it's an ugly, a big grill and everything, but the people who buy them don't care about that. And I've driven all the cars in that segment, the Escalade and the Range Rover. I think the X7 is like uniquely excellent for what it is. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I'm one of the few BMW enthusiasts that actually really likes the X7 because it drives great. It drives well. I wasn't even aware that this was controversial. I thought that everybody liked the X7. Well, I think I think all enthusiasts have used the X7 as the example of BMW kind of like jumping the shark and, you know, the big grill and that it's so large now and the car is so big and blah, blah, blah. But like for what it is, which enthusiasts often have a difficult time of putting themselves in the mindset of like the type of per like Prius is the worst car in the world. Well, no, to the people who are buying it, it's not. But I think to the to the X7 consumers, I think it's excellent. And I really like that car. I would say those are probably my favorite. The recently departed M2. I also personally love the new M3. And I know I'm somewhat alone in this as well. But like they're still doing a stick rear wheel drive sedan. This is it, folks. This is the end. It's over here. This is where it all comes to an end. Like this, the, the current M3, which everybody's laughing at and saying is terrible, in 20 years, that's one of those cars we're talking about. That car will be revered because the next one I guarantee will be an auto only, plug in hybrid, et cetera, et cetera. Might be, yeah. uh, be electric actually because the, they're, they're in a cycle. They kind of, you know, they're stuck in a cycle basically. The next M3, M4 is supposed to come out 2027. So the question is, do they make a plug-in hybrid or they go fully electric in 20, 
2027. Uh, but oh, yeah, good be, point. And by be, then... Exactly. But that's going to be based on what they do with the 3 and 4 series. So they're kind of stuck in between because by 2030, I think most of their lineup will be fully electric or close to yeah. that. But um, 2027, 2028, they don't... Yeah, they're kind of in between. So who knows? Yeah, and I'm sure they'll be amazing. I just drove the i4. My video hasn't gone up yet, but I just drove it. And I thought it was great. Like, it's awesome. But it's definitely the end of an era, what we're in now. So, like, buy that manual M3 with the big front end... And like understand that you know we're down to that car and like the STI or the, which is gone now at the WRX and the Blackwing V like this is the end of the line for these like performance sedans with a manual transmission which was like a staple of performance cars when I was a kid and so like that M3 to me is like is pretty special. We talked to Joe Achilles in the UK and the UK market doesn't get any rear wheel drive manual M3 or M4. So basically just the US, I'm not sure about Germany, I haven't looked into that, but I know for sure the UK people are kind of pissed because I get constant emails and comments that, you know, they would love to have that rear wheel drive manual there too. So wow. we actually get it and they don't. But I didn't are, know that. But they are getting Did the M3 Touring and we're not getting the M3 Touring. That annoys me so much. God. I, that especially surprises me because do you know that E63 wagon is now selling the same amount as E63 sedan and RS6 they're only selling as a wagon so it's like there's a there's a market for this come on I, yeah I actually remember when the, it was first announced that the M3 Touring wasn't coming and I was like Audi and Mercedes are doing it if Audi Audi who won't even give us an RS4 for they, the last RS4 was an 07 they won't even until you know the RS5 comes out yesterday they can't figure that stuff out if Audi is doing it can't BMW, it, that one, that decision was surprising to me, to say the least. Oh, I think they miscalculated. So here's what happens. I can tell you a little bit from behind the scenes once again. Basically, the regular 3 Series Touring, it was never homologated for safety uh, tests or safety yeah. crashes for the U.S. Whenever that car was conceived seven years ago, probably that project started. So at that time, they had no idea that they were doing an M3 Touring. So the M3 Touring project came up came along uh -huh. probably three years ago when Marcus Flash took over BMW M. So he was trying to push, you know, new products and new things. And by that time, they probably had the option to go back and recertify the 3 Series Touring to be, uh, you know, uh, valid for the U.S. crash test, but they never did it. So now they would have to do it for the M3 Touring, and it probably doesn't make sense yeah. financially to invest in all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. It's too bad, though. It is too bad, yeah. I've had I had two E sixty three wagons. I had a CTS V wagon. I had that RS two. I have that RS two now. I would buy an M three Touring if it existed here, but they don't. It's a, it's such a shame. But that makes sense. That makes sense. BMW even teased it in the M Town. Remember the M Town uh, promo that was a couple minutes long. Uh, Marcus Fleisch was reading the newspaper, just kind of leaning on it, and I was like, ah, oh, yes, we're getting it. No, we are getting yeah. the XM though. We are getting that XM seven hundred and fifty horsepower <laughs> plug-in hybrid. That car has some controversy around it, but like seven hundred and fifty horsepower, seven hundred and fifty horsepower. You know. <laughs> Okay. But the X7, you're absolutely right. So the story with the X7 is that we're talking about the U.S. market. So the U.S. market and U.S. enthusiasts kind of liked it. But even now, if you go to Europe and you talk to Germans about the X7, they're like, that's a terrible car. They're like, that's a horrible car. They just don't like big cars then, basically. They don't, yeah. But it made no sense why BMW wasn't in that space anyway, because Mercedes, the GL came out in 07 and has been successful for a long time. BMW needed a competitor. And the X7 is, like, awesome. It really, like... The quality and the highest level versions is like wild, way better than Escalade and even Range Rover, in my opinion. Um, I love that car. I think it's great. I, I, it'd be a great family car if you had a luxury family. You know, I had a couple more. Oh, feel free. If you get, feel free. Yeah. Rapid fire. I got. I knew. I knew you said RS2, and I knew Nico knew, and I knew the second we said M3 or M4, Nico's gonna be like, gotta talk about the RS2. So, I'm really glad we got that out because I, I understand. I totally get it. I get it. All right, let's get back to a little uh, uh, rapid fire, and then we can wrap it up. Ferrari or Lamborghini or Koenigsegg? Ferrari. All right. All right. Uh, this one we probably already know, but BMW or Audi? Um, that's harder than you think. I've generally speaking, BMW. But Mercedes. I hate to say it, but Mercedes Benz over both. I love my R2, but BMW. It's, it, that was a very special car at a special time for Audi, and 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 BMW doesn't quite have an analog. All right, two more, two more. Rear wheel drive or all wheel drive? Um, if you say why not both, it doesn't count. All of my cars except for one are all wheel drive. However, the answer is rear wheel drive still, nonetheless. Okay, respect. Okay, now here's here's a controversial one. Coupe or coupe? <laughs> coupe. 
Bye. I get in fights with people about that. Oh, me too. <laughs> I don't say I don't say Venezia. Like the term is in, in it has been in, it has been Englishized, either Americanized or English in general, to coop. So I say coop. Question, Doug, if you don't mind. Actually, it might be a two yeah. hour question. So first of all, what's your take on Tesla cars? And then uh, with that being said, how do you think your review style will change when they're going to be all electric cars? All new cars will be all electric. How is that going to change your review? You style? know, it's interesting. People ask me that. They're like, "What are you going to do when electric cars come and you're not you're going to and you're not going to have anything to review?" And I'm like, "No way. It's actually the, quite the opposite. The electric cars because they all drive more or less similarly. Um, the automakers have been really going kind of gung-ho about making them all be weird to stand out from each other. And so like I just shot the Ioniq 5, which is bizarre and i just i've shot all these electric cars that are really kind of strange and that's my thing like the weird stuff and so i'm i'm here for that um so i think the the move to electric is gonna in terms of the reviews is gonna be cool because more and more of these automakers have to do different things to distinguish themselves whereas in the past the powertrain the handling that sort of thing could really set them apart now it's it's not as much um as far as tesla i don't know i love them i i tesla's controversial but they make good cars and and um, there's a reason so many people are buying them. The tech is great. For a long time, they were way ahead of everybody else. I think some of the automakers have really been catching up to them. But there's a lot of good reasons to buy them. I recommend Teslas to a lot of people still. Um, and the Tesla Model Y outsold the Honda Accord last year. So whether or not we like it, they are certainly here. <laughs> it's kind of the, the way the world is now. God, wow. I didn't know that. That's on the Honda Accord. That's a big moment. Think about that. When you were a kid, if someone had told you a, an upstart car company would outsell the Honda Accord, from when we were younger, it was like the number three best-selling whatever. And that now part of that is because obviously sedans in general have declined, but nonetheless, here we are. Have you done a Rivian yet? Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Although my favorite of the electric cars, this is controversial, but my favorite is the Hummer EV, which I think is so cool. It's it's. Have you driven it? Yeah, it's the stupidest thing in the world, but it's so cool. Eleven hundred horsepower, nine thousand pounds. You feel like you feel like you own the road because you do. You literally. <laughs> it's amazing. It's crazy. It's enormous. It's like the biggest vehicle I've ever seen. I've never seen one in person, but. Uh... That's great. 9,000 pounds blows my mind. Like there are roads in my, like in New Jersey that you can't drive that on. They're like three ton limits. Like you can't, right. you can't drive it. Right. Yeah. And it does zero to 60 in like three, five or, you know, so. now it turns out that a lot of the super duty trucks get up to that weight, but still it's insane. It's an, and I love it. It actually drives really well and the tech is great. And I, I was pretty impressed by it. And what about Rivian? Cause, um, I, I just talked to BMW about their car, and I told them that my opinion, I haven't driven yet, but I've read most of their reviews. I said it's the only pickup truck that I would consider owning, even though I'm not yeah. a pickup truck person. Yeah, same. I'm and, not a pickup uh, guy, but I'd buy a Rivian. Yeah, and, I love it. I love that. I was blown away by it. Um, I think it's amazing. It's fast. We took it off-road. It was incredible. I'm an off-roader. I do a ton of off-roading. It was incredibly capable. The tech is great. My only concern with both Rivian and Lucid, they, I did the Lucid Air also, which is an amazing car. They're both like really, really, really excellent. But my only concern with those brands ultimately is like my Mercedes Benz, I don't have a Mercedes EQS, but if I did, if that breaks down, I got four Mercedes dealers in, the, in my county. Rivian, well, we, we'll come pick it up. But it's really cool. It's a it's an amazingly cool car, and we'll see how they do. I don't know. So far, they're they're doing reasonably well. They're starting to ship cars. I'm seeing them in Southern California, like almost every day. First one the other day, I couldn't believe it. It was a weird electric day. I drove a Polestar, a BMW iX, and I saw a Rivian R1T. What did you think of the iX there? I have it right now. It's a great car. Um, it's str I still don't like the way it looks, but it's a, I think it's a great luxury EV. I love that interior. How bizarre. BMW is claiming that the grill in that vehicle is self-healing. I did test it actually personally. So I was in Germany when it was the launch and they had a they, they had on display one of those grills. I mean, it's just a piece of plastic really. And I scratched it and then basically they used something to heat it up. I don't remember. Like a heat gun was. or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it needs to worked. be hot. Yeah. yeah. And it actually worked. I mean, it was a mild scratch, wasn't anything deep, but it did work. So I tried it on a piece of plastic. So I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it huh. seems to work. Yeah. You need to get like a blow dryer or something, but still, if it happens, if it, if it does work, it does work, I guess. How bizarre. What a bizarre thing. My favorite part about the BMW iX is in, in like this. I'm going to make fun of it a little bit here. I love the fact that 
they get so excited about the the badge on the front being the washer fluid filler and it's like you're just trying to distract me from the fact that you don't you didn't put a frunk in the car that is an interesting that's an interesting point although i have to tell you i just drove the subaru solterra which is subaru's new electric crossover no front trunk same deal with the toyota version which is somehow called the lowercase b capital z4 capital x bz 4x how'd you remember that i know no one will and the Mercedes EQS also doesn't have a front trunk. And I talked to someone about this, maybe someone at Ford, and they told me that their market research is showing that almost no one is actually using the front trunk. So it turns out that like it's a cool idea, but people don't, for, for regulatory purposes, you have to have like a dual latch situation. BMW has the cool one where you can just pull it twice, but like Ford, you got to pull it once, walk around to the front, do a thing. People don't want to do that. They want to press the button and have it open. And I think that the automakers are finding... It's a neat idea. They like to be able to say they have it, but most people aren't actually using it. So as bad as it, it, it seems like it's a big oversight, but I think it's not really. It turns out for norm for actual use, it turns out not to be a big deal. I asked him too, and they said the same thing. They did a market research, market study, and I can tell you this: I've had i threes for the last seven years. I've never ever used the the uh, yeah. uh, front ever, never. Yeah. So basically, they said, why do you need a front when you have so much space in the back? And also, the research says that nobody really uses it. So. Uh, it would have been complicated for them from what they explained and what they showed me like underneath they pulled out the whole thing and they would have had to really move things around to make space for yeah. the front exactly and even then it's not it doesn't end up being that big the ionic 5 and the kia ev6 both have front trunks and just because they knew they had to for the segment and like you can put nothing it's like a, the size of like a three ring binder or two or three of them and that's like the whole thing but like they probably had to do some stuff just to even make that happen and no one's going to use it anyway Oh, it really doesn't yeah. bother me. Like that iX has so much space inside the car in yeah. the trunk. But yeah, overall, it's a very good car, though. It's like incredibly comfortable. It's shockingly fast. Uh, I got over three hundred miles of range out of one battery, so it's it's a good car. It's a really good car. Yeah, I was impressed with it. I do think it looks weird, but people honestly, in today's car market, people have proven to me. Do you remember when the E sixty five seven series came out in 02 and people were like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen the ugliest. And now I look at some of the cars driving around and I'm like, wow, like this, that seven series is like nothing <laughs> compared to some of the decisions being made in today's automotive space. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, that's it's, I, I recently reviewed an E 65, like an, or, or, like the original OG 65, 760, but still. And, um, it's still ugly in my opinion, but the, the E60, I swear, is looks way more modern than it is. That car, I swear, when if you had an E39 and an E60 next to each other, you would swear that there's a generation missing in between. Like, that car, it wasn't just 0304. Meant, like, when you look at them, it looks like it was like a 10-year... Some of his later designs, like E60 and the Z4, like, I think really were ahead of their yeah, time. I, know, I truly appreciate you coming on board, you know, and talking to us uh if you ever want to come back we'll be happy to have you it's a, was a fantastic chat honestly and i feel like we have a lot more questions for you but it's been awesome it's been epic yeah well i appreciate it thank you very much and thanks for having me